let us go into biomarkers in a little more detail. For that, I would invite Dr. Darius Shroff, a dashing vitreoretinal surgeon from Delhi. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for that kind introduction. So now that we have an overview, I'll be speaking on imaging biomarkers, which help because the main aim of this course is to target and tailor and personalize uh, retina therapy. So I'd like to thank Dr. Neha Goel and for her help also with this presentation. So when we go through this very crowded uh, table, you can see the imaging focus basically relies on things like fluid, the retinal layers, vasculature, and the CNVM. So if you see all these, the common factor is the OCT scan, which is very vital for us to look for any of these biomarkers. It's important that we kind of standardize the anatomical landmarks to be able to read a OCT scan well. And this consensual group which published in ophthalmology in 2014, this paper is excellent. So anybody interested in image, I would recommend you read this. And this helps us to th see the OCT layer by layer, decipher the layers. And only if we know the normal structure are we able to identify these important biomarkers. Why do we need them? There is no reliable method which determines which individuals will gain or lose vision over time. So these predictive biomarkers become a major unmet need when we see patients in our OPD. These would help to enhance patient counseling because as retina specialists, we know it's very, very important to counsel patients correctly if we want them to comply with our therapy, injection, to accept their vision, etc., and improve risk for stratification. Possible visual equity bio, uh, surrogates have been the ELM integrity, the EZ integrity, and the presence of subretinal fluid. I think all of these are going to be discussed by later speakers in detail, so I'll just discuss a few of them and the more important ones. So drill. So drill was one of the markers published first by Dr. Jennifer Sun in 2014. And uh, this is very important. You can see that uh, the image itself is quite clear where the uh, uh, drill is present and where you can see the inner layers clean clearly and it's absent. And the horizontal extent in micron is what we have to calculate. Drill is assessed independently and not graded differently in the presence of CME, intratal cis, ERM, SRF, or any other OCD evident pathology. So it's a totally independent to these. So that's important to know. And here you can see these animations and the area marked with drill and that can be calculated. So the association of drill extent with vision was more consistent and robust than any other SD OCD uh, biomarker. And uh, uh, in the central 1 mm area, they said a drill increase of 300 micron uh, from baseline four months reduced the vision by one line compared to the baseline. So the relevance is that drill seems to be correlative predictor biomarker that is independent of the central retinal thickness uh, in eyes with a basal central involving DME. Unanswered question about it is whether the visual acuity uh, potential declines with increasing drill location. So this is something we still don't know. Now we come to these HR, so the hyperreflective spots, dots, hypercryphosi, they are all these terms have been used interchangeably. So what is it? It's a, a foci which is less than 30 micron. The reflectivity is more than the RP band. And what is in interesting to see, you can see on the scan that there's no um, back shadow caused by this. So it's, and then there's no visible hard exudate in that location. It's focal and discrete. Is it dis disease specific? No, you can see this long list of uh, retinal diseases in which we can see these uh, HRF. And it can be anywhere. It can be from the inner retina to outer retina in, the, in DR, and it's supposed to travel from the outer retina to inner retina in AMD. Why does it happen? Because of the blood retinal barrier breakdown. Some people say it's because it's a precursor to hard exudates. Others say it are degenerative photoreceptors, or it could be macrophages which have engulfed the degenerative photoreceptors. The other theory is because there's, it's a cause because of pigment migration, but nobody has ever proved that these are cell. So the presence of these in the outer retina is closely associated with disrupted EL, uh, endo, uh, ELM and ISOS line. And this is what has been said to be the cause of the decrease in visual equity in these patients. So is it machine dependent? So basically, other thing which people say when you talk about these biomarkers is that I have uh, a machine, I, you, uh, somebody has X, Y, Z different machine. 
So this was an interesting study by <coughs> Dr. Ushula Efforts group from uh, Vienna. And they found that although these focal hyperreflective deposits are seen on all them, but they're most impressively seen on the spectralis. So that's not to promote any machine, but we need to be mindful that if we are following patients from different clinics on different machines, everything may not be exactly the same. So this is the images from different machines and you can see the difference in the number of dots. So it's an interesting finding, whether it has a structural element of its own is not established and the utility claimed seems to be far beyond in what is actually proven. Uh, when we come to CNVM, I'll just touch upon this very briefly because I think there's already a talk on this, but active CNV, but Cosca's group from France has said that at least three of the following features, the well-defined, the lacy or C-fan shaped network, the branching dense capillary network, the anastomotic loops, or the uh, perilational uh, in hypo-intense halo, halo. So if any of these three are present, it's supposed to be active CNVM, where it's quiescent if less than three of these. But these don't have any predictive value to guide uh, anti of therapy, so we are still dependent on our structural B-scan to do that. So just an image where you can see the lacy network. So these are on the uh, left side, uh, uh, you can see the active ones, whereas the filamentous one with the dead tree appearance are the inactive. I think ORT already was described, but outer retinal tubulation is something which we need to be very mindful of because this should not be mis uh, misdiagnosed as CME. Because CME, if we see CME, generally the tendency is to treat these patients. So these are round oval lesions with a hyperreflective lumen and hyperreflective border. And they're seen in advanced AMD, CNV, GA uh, associated poor vision and photoreceptor loss. And even degenerative diseases, uh, dystrophies like our, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, stargards, etc., might have these, and develop in uh, because of the photoreceptor disruption by invagination of the remaining cells and scrolling of the ELM. So it may be a response to uh, preserve the photoreceptor survival, but they have poor prognosis, and this could be one indication to stop therapy in such patients. So with this, uh, just a bird's eye view, I conclude that they help personalize of medical uh, retina for our patients and a tailored approach is best to treat our patients better. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much Darius for providing us with that overview. We'll go to a brief discussion uh, regarding this before Dr. Natasha goes in. So um, uh, Darius, uh, can you tell us like based on the pattern, let's first talk about diabetic macular edema. Based on the pattern on OCT, whether it is cystoid, spongy or uh, sub foveal detachment, would you consider changing your injections, etc.? Yeah, so that's a good question. Actually, bas basically what we found is uh, chronicity seems to be more associated with the large cystoid macular edema. So nowadays, I, I, these are the ones, of course, even the, there's a lot about the hyperreflective dots uh, along with those, but then those are the ones which, if, especially if they don't respond, we try to uh, treat them with st uh, steroid. Of course, DEX implant or IVT, whatever, that is your choice. But these, we would be more keen to change our treatment pattern to steroids. And uh, otherwise, I mean, think you have to take the whole gamut. There's no, uh, like I said, a tailored approach because some of these spongy form, maybe we do good, good FFA and you find some leak. So we still, I think, focal laser has a role in those. So I think we should try to see the big picture also. And these are just things to help us. I think we can't be talking about one particular biomarker and using it. I think that's a very, very valid point. You see, you need to see the bigger picture. Dr. 